He had his gun, so he just swung it open. I start to notice that, you know, the atmosphere feels a little bit weird. First thing he seen was this six and a half foot tall, broad shoulder, dark hair, that freaked him out. We hadn't talked to her about like life and death and what any of that means. She's three years old, you know. So we turned around. Suddenly there's a whole tree falling across the road. And she was describing to us that, you know, there was a deceased person uh, that she could see, she could see visually. You're listening to Cryptid Clues, where we tackle the ever-expanding history and mystery of monsters and supernatural madness every Monday and Friday. You can find us at cryptidclues.ca for more information, or even check out exclusive content such as interviews and D&D campaigns at patreon.com slash cryptidclues. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of Cryptid Clues, Campfire Clues. I am your host, Taylor, and today we're looking into some more Sasquatch encounters. But before we get into that, a couple of plugs. You can find us in our past episodes along with blog posts via our website, cryptidclues.ca, our social media channels, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. And should you venture out towards Patreon, you can find ad-free early episodes available there. Also, if you want to reach out to us directly, you can via our email cryptidclues at gmail.com now first off i want to shout out ruben's haunt of the Grassman campaign using DD fifth edition rules ruben has created an immersive narrative experience that has the full episode one and episode two preview on our main feeds the full episode two and upcoming episodes will drop exclusively on our patreon but without further ado let's dive into our first experience now this one takes place out in michigan and uh, it's, it's, it's something. It's something. Well, let's get into it. And I quote, I'm looking for a rational explanation to what I heard last winter out in the woods of Michigan. It was January 8th, and I wanted to get out and explore some public hunting land three hours northwest of Detroit. Deer season is over, and it's absolutely freezing outside. The reason I go out this time of year is no one is usually crazy enough to go out or has any reason to. So I usually get the woods to myself, and I'm, I'm maybe a mile off the road looking out at a small lake surrounded by trees. The lake sat somewhat down in a small valley compared to the surroundings. And that's when I hear a single knock, loud, like someone hit a tree with a baseball bat. It sounded several hundred yards away, so I continued to walk in that direction. I heard the sound, then another knock, still several hundred yards away this time, followed by chatter of varying pitch. I thought it might be a turkey or some bird I've never heard before, but the knocking continued, and so did the chatter. The chatter, now coming from two different sources in the same direction, my German shepherd is looking in the direction the sound came from, tilting her head back and forth like WTF. At this point, the hair on the back of my neck is standing straight up because I can't see into the woods where the sound is coming from and my dog won't take her eyes off that location either. I still to this day have no idea what made the knocking sound. It could have been a person and the shatter could have been some large bird, but I never saw a car parked anywhere. A person or footprints of a person when I got back to my vehicle, I drove down the road to see if anyone was parked or had parked. Nothing but fresh snow. What else out there could have made these noises I heard? The knocking and the chatter was without a doubt coming from the same location. End quote. So first off, Michigan. Oh, Michigan. And this is probably going to be a reoccurring theme kind of throughout this episode tonight, but you have such an interesting level of occurrences taking place there from Bigfoot to Dogman. The list gets pretty lengthy. So when someone comes forward with a possible sighting relating to a Sasquatch north of Detroit, it becomes a game. Where can we try and connect it with other sightings that maybe occur in that area at that given time? Now, I do have additional information. With some, there were some questions that were posed to this individual, and in regards to what they experienced, they had listened to the Sierra sounds following these occurrences, and they stated it was not what they heard. 
And for reference, I'll play a small piece of the Sierra sounds here right now for anyone that hasn't heard them before. Those sounds get me every time I hear them. Now, those were audio clips, vocalizations that were captured by Al Berry and Ron Moorhead. That was in 1972 in the Sierra Mountains. Uh, there's a link below in the description. It goes to ronmoorhead.com, his website. Definitely check that out for a ton of additional information. Uh, we also have an episode on our feed where we interviewed uh, Mr. Ron Moorhead, me and Ruben. Fantastic, fantastic conversation. He was just such an incredible guest to have on the show and really just get uh, get down to business and talk with just to hear his thoughts so definitely check that out but getting back to this person's experience the assumption all around is that it could perhaps have been some very heavy barred owls which i have a clip here i'm going to play for you now i think the common association that people are forming here is it's not necessarily imitating the whoop sounds or the chatter that people might hear but more so the wood knocks now we got into a little bit before me and Ruben and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later in this episode about the vocalizations and such but I think that's what the general assumption is they hear the barred owls and that could be associated with the wood knocking and the smacking noise and just a misidentification of a vocalization or an audible noise created by a Sasquatch. Now, it definitely does have a monkey-like sound to it, though, when you hear it, like the hoo 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 So there is that component, too, if people are thinking it could be just a vocalization of a Bigfoot. Uh, and just for the heck of it, for those who are unfamiliar with turkey sounds, as mentioned in this individual's experience, here is a turkey uh, making some noises, just for reference, basically. Now that, I would totally believe, could fool somebody. If you're out in the woods and you never heard that kind of chatter before, never heard a turkey sound, and you start hearing that pop off in the woods, and if you don't get a good look at it, it's in the dark, you could easily misidentify. And I'm not saying that, at the end of the day, this individual misidentified, because what he heard was something unique to him in this experience and his perspective. But again, he wasn't able to match it to the Sierra sound, so then what kind of category can we allot it to? We can compare it and we can kind of take what he relates it to, to these other sounds that we've listened to so far and associate it. But again, it doesn't mean that it is these things. I can make similar sounds to other animals, but it doesn't mean that, again, I am associated or am that animal. So it could be very much that this Bigfoot is just sounding off like familiar things out in the woods because these are things that are in its domain and maybe they do have a knack for imitating on certain occasion human beings of I've, I've explored other other people's experiences that have talked and spoken to how bigfoot have repeated and vocalized things and words that they've said so maybe it could very well do the same thing with animals it's just something that again we just don't know and have enough information about but i digress before i move on I alluded to this earlier, Ruben and I did some deep diving into the possible ways of communication for Sasquatch. Definitely recommend checking that episode out, but as we spoke about tree knocks and how that method of communication has actually been recently observed in other primates, I wanted to speak further on that, on how the tree knocks may not even be tree knocks. Again, I alluded to this earlier, people have claimed to see them actually cupping their hands to their mouth and making that knocking sound. Similar to how we can make knocking, clicking sounds with our mouths, like, well, I'm not spiking your, the mic and <laughs> blowing out your, your headphones, but a piece of evidence to this assumption would be that different wood types and hits can result in a plethora of different sounds. Where most wood knocks are very similar and consistent, thus assuming the sounds are vocal and used by many Sasquatch. Now, the notion of this being a vocal method of communication doesn't surprise me. There is, I've explored many interviews where people have heard 
words, like I said before, being audibly spoken out within their presence. So it's just we need to dive into more of that communication and that vocal range and vocabulary that these things are capable of producing. So it's fascinating. It's very, very fascinating. And if wood knocks are indeed just a, a vocalization, those are some powerful, powerful audible levels that are being hit. And again, with this individual, if this was Sasquatch related indeed, then it, it fits the bill because these knocks and sounds, he was hearing them several hundred yards away this time as he was moving progressively closer to the location. So it's one of those things that we just won't be able to have an answer to until we kind of get back out there and maybe find some footprints or some other common uh, affiliated pieces of evidence that are associable with a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot and see what we can kind of track down. But until then, I'm not there, so I can't speak to it fully. But thank you very much to the individual that was allowing me to share this experience. Really appreciate it. Uh, moving on here, I'm just going to jump to a quick ad break, and then we'll be right back. And we're back. So our next encounter, this is this is definitely going back a ways here. It's the 1920, the Cope, hope I'm saying that right, Falls Bigfoot. Now, in the foothills of the Blue Mountains, this is uh, basically Washington, Columbia County, there's a lady in her 80s that had recounted an experience that had taken place when she was a child back in the 1920s in the Copper Fall, Cope Falls area. This is something that I stress about a lot because there is so much history and information to be gathered from members of the previous, uh, this, I don't want to sound inappropriate, fa phasing out, expiring generations, <laughs> our, our, our elders that we need to talk to, we need to gather and around and listen to this information because there is such a high level of valuable insight that we lack that we need to understand and learn from that's it's all about growing old being wise and bestowing that wisdom on to the next generation and that's something that we're getting from the internet and google these days you know we're not getting that properly from our ancestors and our elders so when you have someone like this who comes forward to share their experiences and their sightings especially that's when it gets really really interesting you know, people back then, some maybe wanted a claim to fame, they wanted to earn an extra buck, but for the most part, when these things happened out in the middle of nowhere, they happened. These people aren't looking to make a killing off of it by selling a body to the circus or something like that back in the day. There wasn't proper internet or ways to report this kind of stuff. Things were still fresh and new and unique. And so when you have this, again, I'm just babbling on here and I apologize, but it's it gets very, very interesting. So I digress. She had claimed that Sasquatch would chase around the elk and even run them off a cliff edge near the falls, to which they would grab them at the bottom of the cliff and hike away with their meal. This method was also coincidentally used by early Native Americans when hunting buffalo. This is there's actually a place. Uh, um, my wife's father told us about this place uh gosh and you think i could remember it it was a famous place because it has the logo of the bison falling off the cliff and this was something that uh used to happen here where the bison would just run off and they would die and just be taken away at the bottom but i digress another thing that reuben and i have discussed on the possibility of sasquatch here observing humans is reflected now because if these sasquatch are watching human beings run bison and other animals off a cliff to harvest them down below then it makes sense that a sasquatch tries to imitate this mannerism replicates it for their own benefit it's similar to what we spoke to earlier when you say hello and then you hear a hello back from the woods like oh my god like whatever reason if it's curiosity or it is an understanding a conscious understanding of how this can benefit them and their group family pod um it's just it's a heightened level of intelligence that's what it is and it's something we do see in monkeys and other primates where they can kind of imitate <laughs> but as the lady reported the encounters weren't limited to one sasquatch but a group of them they would often get caught raiding her families and other nearby residents gardens and farm farmlands these occurrences started becoming more and more frequent having found a multitude of footprints in and around the property. There's one instance here where one finally got close enough to their house that when she looked at her window, 
It was one of the bigger ones, and it was pressing its face up against the glass. These things also consistently happened to other nearby residents, to the point where many people were thinking, I'm out, we're moving away from this property, goodbye. And finally, it got very, very close and personal here when the, she was out exploring the property and she unfortunately bumped into one of these things. And as she reports it, clocked in at around six feet tall, she saw it reaching out towards a tree and it had brown covered hair, a face with gray skin. She claimed it was like an owl with how it moved and its head rotated around to stare at her. So naturally, She's frozen in fear in the moment. She stood waiting until the creature lost interest, and then eventually, on its own accord, it moved off into the bush. She also claimed that the Sasquatch were a family group, as there were many sightings, as I mentioned earlier, that they even had discerned each other with designated grunts or not specific names like Todd or Howard or anything like that, but audible noises with these grunts like oh, there's a er, er, and there's ah, ah, like st something like that. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on it, but that's just my understanding. And one more final thing, however, she claims that when they got angry, they wouldn't hold back and would throw the rocks at whatever made them angry to begin with. So there's a lot to dissect there. Me and Ruben in a coming up episode on Monday, we dive into the little foreshadow. We dive into a bunch of different tapes that people have recorded of actual Bigfoot encounters. And we talk about the movements and just different components to the videos. And we do talk about how the heads move in some of those videos. And so when I see that way the head was rotating to stare, it's very interesting because they, they reportedly don't have much of a neck, right? So it's, it's a very limited uh, peripheral turn of the head. And for anything further than that, you would imagine it has to be more or less the body that's turning. So it's these finite little details that you can kind of look into. When she says it claimed like an owl, I think just how the head's turning to side to side right away. I, I don't see it as turning and doing a full 360. If it is, that's some possessed type Bigfoot. I'm not going to speak to that. That's something maybe Ruben can speak to that because he's a little bit more onto the biblical side of, of Sasquatch than I am myself. But I digress. Now, when we talk about the rocks being thrown, we definitely know that rock throws are a common Sasquatch occurrence, but it also helps to learn a little bit more regarding the reasoning and the mannerisms, which we really don't know much about, aside from you know angry, territorial. But what I mean by this is that distinction as to why they would throw those rocks. Negative response, intrusive forces, negative forces, all that kind of stuff like I mentioned. And in many cases, I've heard these rocks landing near people, but they never really hit and land that blow. Now, don't get me wrong. This doesn't dismiss the notion that they have of trying to hit us. I'm sure they very well could be trying, but the ones that do get hit, probably either they don't make it out and they're forever lost in the woods, missing 411 cases. But for the most part, it's a blatant display of just, hey, buzz off. At least that's how I interpret it. Then the last thing that these things want, an intelligent being, is to kill someone for no reason. Because then it draws attention. When you know there's an unending amount of other human beings out there and these human beings piss you off when they come into your home, you don't want to draw their gaze into your home even more so if you take one out. Especially if they are coming in and maybe limiting pockets of Sasquatch. Now, I say this and I'm not trying to justify like, oh, humans get a free pass or anything like that, but it's people, people do kill for sport. And while there are animals that kill, obviously, they're usually doing it for a specific nature abiding law for survival, threatened, territorial, you know, it's, it's a, a justified reason that we have been able to observe in the animal kingdom. And I think that's the same with a Sasquatch. I don't think it's gonna go out and willy-nilly just kill you. It's thinking a few different things. This is my territory, this is my home, this is my food, this is all this kind of stuff. You can imagine it. So I'm gonna throw a rock and tell this thing to get out of here while it's still uh, capable of doing so. <laughs> in many instances, people notice, okay, there's multiple rocks being thrown. So, okay, there's multiple Sasquatch in the area or it's one that's just really just dishing it out. And these things seem to be given lots of warnings to people, which is great. And hopefully no one has been domed in the head and taken out permanently. That would be very, very unfortunate. But I don't have all the answers on that, so I can't speak to it as to why 
truthfully they are throwing the rocks, I can only speculate. And hopefully no one has been ousted by a rock thrown and that most people do get out of the situation. I digress. To kind of close out this episode, I found an interesting thing tying back to Michigan. And if you Google this, and it recently popped up onto the media today, and this is something that is a few years old, I think around six years old, and it takes place in Michigan, and it is a eagle nest cam. The camera is basically just focused on some baby uh, eagles just kind of in their nest, just chirping away. And out in the corner of the video, you can actually see a blobby, big, hairy figure strutting uh, about, you know, in the corner of this the camera frame. And it does zoom in, and you can see it moving around and everything. Now, this this does coincide with our episode that me and Ruben were releasing on Monday when we talk about the movements of these Sasquatch and these videotapes. And this one, remember the term marble uh, mountain, because this movement that this supposed Sasquatch is doing, it seems very... Uh, mirrored of that at least to me and and people are saying it's fake or oh wow this thing knows exactly where to walk for the camera right out in the open in the corner there but it's 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 tricky because it, it moves unpredictably and animalistically like a bigfoot or other animals you would think would and then all of a sudden it's it just mid stops and transitions into just looks like a human a guy and maybe in a suit moving around but there's that interesting uh familiarity and combination of the two and uh yeah it just it gets me it really really gets me i definitely recommend checking that out because this is just another sighting that has occurred with michigan yes it is a few more years old but there's no shortage of sasquatch sightings that are popping off in michigan it's incredible there was one uh gentleman his name was craig sulk and he was a hunter and he had many trail cams set up on 80 acres worth of property that he had and he used the trail cameras primarily just to monitor the game moving through his land but eventually he got something you know sasquatch like moving through on on these trail cams and again this happened back in 2012 and he didn't come forward with it until uh you know, fortunately later on uh, years later on in february but he passed away shortly after so there's not too much information that can be additionally gathered, and it's very unfortunate that he did pass. But there's enough going on in Michigan that they've actually started doing a convention out there. So at the end of the day, I would love to eventually travel out there and check it out because it's you know famous for Michigan Dogman, other Sasquatch stuff. People claim that there are tons of family groups, like 10 at once in a group out there. So. It's something that I'm going to have to revisit because Michigan is just rich in cryptid activities. Definitely something to stay tuned for in the future, but I digress. Without further ado, let's close out this episode now. I hope you had a great time as much as I did talking about this stuff. I got some other cool content coming up, very local Bigfoot stuff that I'm trying to work out and speak to the gentleman about in regards to. Um, but yeah, you can find us on our website, cryptidclues.ca. You can find us on our social media channels, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, our Patreon, where you get ad-free early episodes. And if you want to reach out to us directly, you can send us an email, cryptidclues at gmail.com. Without further ado, thank you everyone for tuning in. Remember, take care and stay safe. <laughs>